The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website. Hi everybody, my name is Kim Hachio. Welcome to Live and Learn. Hey, stay with me today because my guest Molly Nance and I will be talking about swimming as a lifetime sport and about her amazing 22 mile swim between the Caribbean islands of San Lucia and Martinique. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Kristen Stowes and I was curious about the history of parliamentary procedure and why this process, along with Robert's Rules of Order, has been followed for over 140 years. Please stay with us to hear the important points of order from professional registered parliamentarian, Karen Watson. I'm Doug Joves. Today I will visit with Peggy Reischer and Dale Johannes about preventing brain injuries and what you can do to help yourself recover. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake. And just a reminder that the Lincoln Children's Zoo is not just for children, it's for people of all ages. And John Chapo, the executive director and CEO is with us today. And we're gonna take a look at the year round open now Lincoln Children's Zoo. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Hi everybody, my name's Kim Hachio. Welcome to Live and Learn. You know, swimming has been called sort of a sport for all ages and a lifelong sport. And people enjoy it for recreation, for exercise. My guest today is, um, she enjoys it for exercise, recreation, and avocation. Um, she's a long distance open water swimmer who earlier this, earlier this year became the first person to swim from the Caribbean island of St. Lucia to Martinique. Um, and that's 22 miles. So welcome today, my good friend, Molly Nance. Thank you, Kim. Actually, I'm the first woman to do it. There has been a gentleman who's done it oh, in the past. Oh, okay. Well, that's, <laughs> that's even better then, right? That, that's awesome. So full disclosure, Molly and I have been really good friends for probably, what, 25 at years least, at yeah. least. And um, Molly's also the um, uh, big wheel at the Doherty Water for Food Institute at the University of Nebraska. So water is kind of a through line in Molly's life. And you've been a swimmer for a long time. Tell me a little bit about how you got started being a swimmer. Sure. I started swimming like most kids. I swam in the local pool when I was a kid. I joined the swim team when I was a teenager and swam in high school. Uh, college was a little too intimidating. I didn't know if I could handle the, the intensity of the workouts and the, you know, the focus. So I didn't do it in college, um, but really returned to it later in life in my late 30s, early 40s, got back into swimming and discovered open water swimming when I started doing triathlons and I thought well heck this is awesome I, there's no flip turns I can get from one end to the other it's beautiful outdoors and discovered that open water swimming was its own thing there are people who do this all over the world so that's kind of what got me into it I know that it's um, swimming seems like sort of a singular sport but actually you just said there's people all over mm -hmm. the world that do this mm -hmm. so all over the world Tell me about where you have gone all over the world to swim. Oh my gosh, well, I've been fortunate um, to have gone to both coasts. Um, I went to um, England to try to swim the English Channel. Um, I have swum in the Dead Sea <laughs> in Jordan. Um, so a lot of pretty exciting places. Pretty exciting places. Yeah. So how did you get the idea to do this, um, this particular swim we're talking about? Well, it, it came from, um, a swim that I was not able to finish, which was the English Channel. It was a, um, just wasn't my day. I ended up swallowing quite a bit of seawater, which made me really ill. And then I got really cold. And I had been training for the cold, but um, with the nausea combined with that, I just, I knew I wasn't gonna be able to finish it. So it was a big disappointment. But I thought, well, there's, there's a lot of water in this world. You know, maybe there's some other place. And some friends of ours were talking about their vacation to St. Lucia and what a beautiful place it was. And I said, wow, well, where is that exactly? And we, we literally took out the, the globe and saw that it's in the Southern Caribbean. And then I noticed there's this little island above it that just happened to be 22 miles away, about the same distance as the English Channel. And knowing that the water would be quite a bit warmer, I thought, well, maybe I could do that. So I started doing research and found that there was just one other swimmer who had done it. 
Um, and then just, you know, through the internet and email, started making connections and getting a crew lined up and decided to make it happen. So I think we have a picture of sort of the location in your little and your map. There it is. There's my track. There's mm -hmm. your track. That's and the track of the it, swim. And it took you how long? Just shy of 14 hours. 13 hours, 56 minutes. Wow. It was a long day. Wow, it was a long day. <laughs> and we have, um, I think there might be a little bit of video. It was pretty kind of choppy, right? A little bit, a yeah. Little bit it's what you'd expect. Yeah. Um, but, you know, here in Nebraska, there's really no way to train for this. Um, I swam a lot at Branched Oak Lake, um, and there, it can get pretty choppy at Branched Oak, but these swells, um, there's just nothing to prepare you for right. that. And it does, it makes you seasick, just like it would if you were on a boat. But the water is incredibly blue. It's so. gorgeous. And the it's water warm. was beautiful. You said and it, it was, was very comfortable. It was about 80 degrees. Yeah. Um, I just... I just couldn't believe I was getting to swim in this beautiful, beautiful place. I loved it. So tell me about the, the preparations for it. You had mm -hmm. to set up a crew. Had to set up a crew, so I had to find a boat captain. Um, the boat captain needs to have a crew to help run the boat. I needed to have an official observer to document the swim. I had Paul, my husband, served as my, he, he did what we call feeds. It doesn't sound very appealing, um, but that's essentially throwing a bottle of carbohydrate drink to me about every half hour. I also had a first responder, a first aid person in case I needed some medical assistance. And I had a support swimmer and I had a support kayaker. So that's a big crew. And these Takes were- team. It, and it, yeah, and except yeah. for Paul, these were all people that you had never met. I hadn't and met. And so you just yeah. had to- yeah. Hope yeah. it all worked out. And yeah. we got along beautifully. They were all um, very committed to the swim, really excited, shared my enthusiasm for it. They're just, they were fantastic. So day of the swim, you get in the water. Mm -hmm. uh, it, tell me a little bit about how that works. I mean, how, I mean, well, you get it. all, we call it getting greased up. I uh, used um, practically an entire tube of Desitin diaper cream. This is the white that you see all over my skin, which works as a fabulous sunscreen and it doesn't wa wash off. So that's really important when you're in the sun all day long in the water. And then I also had lanolin um, that helps with anti-chafing because when you're in the salt water, all of a sudden your swimsuit, you know, becomes oh. like sandpaper. Um, so I had all of that and we were, I was in the water at about 4.30 in the morning and got out about 7.30 that evening. <laughs> so I think of maybe the sort of issues you might have encountered, sharks, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. jellyfish, mm -hmm. Um, apparently, it was seaweed that was more The of a seaweed problem. was the yeah. biggest thing. I was most concerned about jellyfish. Uh, jellyfish can pack a wallop and, you know, ruin a swim and, and actually, you know, you can get hospitalized. Right. Um, fortunately, there were, there were, I ran into a couple of jellyfish, but they weren't any big deal. I wore shark bands, which are magnetic bracelets and ankle bracelets that help repel sharks. Um, I don't think a giant great white would really care. It would just go ahead and have its lunch. Um, but fortunately, I didn't run into any marine life. Um, it was it was no big deal. The the only difficulty I had was with the seasickness. But with the warmer water, I was able to just kind of throw up and keep swimming. <laughs> so the seaweed thing, though, yeah. did you just have to just bear through it or? Yeah, and, and it wasn't as bad as what I thought it would be. I was envisioning kelp, which have these big, you know, knots like right. knuckles on them and serrated edges. And, and it was like rosemary, you know, it was like swimming oh. through bunches of rosemary. And, and it had what are called sea lice. These are mi almost microscopic baby jellyfish and they kind of sting a little bit. So they were full of that, but you know, you just swim through it, you pull it out of your suit, you keep going. So how do you train for something like this? Well, I would go to the Y every morning before work and swim an hour and a half to two hours. Um, in the evenings, I'd you know take the dog for a walk, maybe go for a bike ride. And then on the weekends, I'd put in longer swims, anywhere from three hours to six hours. And I did um, two weekends where I did six hours back to back. So Saturday and Sunday, I'd swim six hours each. Those were my, my really long training swims. And so you would do this um, Mostly at the Y, or yeah. but sometimes I know that you like to go out to Branch mm -hmm. Stoke and swim. And Normally I would go out to Branch Stoke, but the swim was in May, so I just had pool swims leading up to it. Um, I did go out to um, California once before the swim and swam in the bay, which was quite cold. Um, but again, there just there weren't any conditions that I could swim in that would replicate what I was going to have in St. Lucia. I just had to figure it, figure it out while I was there. Wow. So let's talk a little bit about swimming as a lifetime mm -hmm. sport. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, 
It's incredible. I go to swim events where there are 90 year olds, 100 year olds still swimming. It is a wonderful lifelong sport because you don't have that impact that can affect your joints and, and cause pain. I sure hope to be doing it long into my elder elderly years. Um, and you'll find that most marathon swimmers, well, a lot of them anyway, are in their mid-40s on up because it takes a lot of time. And you don't have that when you're raising kids and right. starting a career. Right. So it's something that a lot of folks do later. Yeah. I, I know that as you see a lot of older people that are running and doing these kind of sports, probably because of the time, but also you develop a different kind of a commitment to your, mm -hmm. to your sport mm -hmm. and to your, and as long as your body holds up, you yeah. might as well try it. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I know you've told me that you really like the sensory experience I do. of being water. I love the feeling of water on my skin. I mean, if you think about it, of course, skin is your, your largest organ and, and it just feels good to be in the water and to have that buoyancy. Um, it's just an enjoyable sport. It's what I like about it. And it gives you time to think, you know, you're alone with your, how many times do you have a chance to just get away from everything? You know, there's no computer screen, nobody's telling me what to do. Um, you're just alone with your thoughts in the water. It's a good feeling. So do you think your kind of sport takes more, I don't know, self-discipline or? You know, I don't know as it takes any more self-discipline as any others. Um, you know, because it's swimming, I find it's the kind of thing that I need to do in the morning because you got to get changed and take a shower and there's all of that. So for me, if I don't get up in the morning and do it, it, it frequently doesn't get done. Right. But yeah, right. like any sport, you have to decide, you know, make a goal. That's what keeps me going. Mm -hmm. um, if I don't have a goal, I tend to, that time easily gets filled up with other things. So, so what's your next goal? Well, that's a good question. I don't, um, I don't have a big goal for next year, but I think in 2020 I will head back to the Caribbean and I'm, I'm taking a look at a swim from Martinique, uh, starting in Martinique, which is the, the island that I landed on, to Dominique. And that has not been done before by anyone. So we'll see. How far is that? 25 miles. 25, mm -hmm. wow, that seems far. Yeah, but it is. I know. <laughs> but but That's you go, I go slowly, you right. know, it's not, um, it's not a race. It's just taking your time and, and, you know, sometimes it's just by 10 minute increments, trying to make it through the next 10 minutes and then you feel a little better and you, j you just keep going. Right. And it's just kind of the, I know you've talked about how nice and warm it was down there, but were, was the response heartwarming for it you? Was. Were people excited about the swim and they were um, you got the, to write your name on a wall yeah uh, similar that's you get to do that in uh, England if you swim the English Channel so I I suggested to uh, one of the the bar owners that has a, a yacht club actually on the beach I said well maybe we could revive this and this be, would be something other swimmers could contribute to and we'll make this you know a, a real destination point for for this kind of event and they were excited about that uh, the people in St. Lucia were just fantastic. I, I couldn't have done the swim without this team, you know, because mm -hmm. while I was swimming and I'm, you know, losing confidence, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to make it, and everybody's on the boat, and they're watching me, and they're encouraging me, and it just, that's what kept me going. Right, Yeah. right. And so at the end, you swim up, and you run up on the shore, do you? <laughs> well, I wish I could have run up on the shore. It was more like a giant seal getting beached on a... <laughs> on the beach and I get up and I'm covered in mud and sand and everything and 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 I'm just un you know it's just I can't believe that we did it it was definitely a we feeling at that moment that it was something that uh, my crew accomplished then helped me accomplish and yeah I got pretty teary it was it was overwhelming it was well, a pretty exciting moment and it was exciting for us who watched you on Facebook. So <laughs> I want to thank you. you, Molly, for being my guest today. Ken, and thank you. Yeah, this has well, been fun. it's I been fun it. and it's gone fast. And I want to remind our viewers it's never too late to live and learn. Hi, I'm Randy Jones with Aging Partners. Did you know that Lincoln expects a 75% increase in the number of seniors living in our community over the next 15 years? Aging Partners is a community service that provides fitness programs to help keep older adults strong and healthy. This year, Lincoln Cares donations are providing funds for new fitness equipment. You can help make this happen. Sign up to support Lincoln Cares and add $1 to your LES bill each month. Any civic or business meeting uses parliamentary procedure, but have any of us given much thought as to why? 
I'm Kristen Stowes, and I'm pleased to welcome professional registered parliamentarian Karen Watson, who will give us the backstory on Robert's Rules of Order. Karen, welcome to Live and Learn. Thank you, Kristen. So nice to have you here today. Honestly, this is a fairly unusual subject to become so involved in, at least to the extent that you have. I'm curious to know how you originally became focused on parliamentary procedure. Most parliamentarians become parliamentarians because of an experience with a bad meeting. Oh, is that what happened? <laughs> And so then you got into the subject matter, and what, what appealed to you about it that made you think, gosh, I'd really like to learn more? When you learn, Roberts, you learn how meetings can be conducted fairly and with efficiency. There's no guessing. When you know the rules, it's to provide fairness for the members in the organizations, and that fascinated me. Well, you really took it to heart, and you went through a lot of training. Tell us about the training that it took to become a professional registered parliamentarian. All right. There are two national associations of parliamentarians. I chose to be credentialed with the National Association of Parliamentarians. First, you have to pass a membership test, which is basically you have to know basic information about Robert's Rules of Order. Okay. From there, if you want to become registered, you must do an extensive exam. It contains five parts. It will take you anywhere from three to six months of self-study. Each part of the exam must be graded at at least 80%. Okay. The five different parts. It takes about five hours, six hours to do the exam. You're proctored. Okay. Then to become a professionally registered parliamentarian, that is where you can apply the book knowledge to actually leading a meeting. And there you go before a credentialing board. It takes about three days at a convention. You, you not only re, you not only show them that you have the intellectual knowledge, but that you can practically provide the service oh, as well. How long did this process take you, Karen? For me, it took about two years. Okay, all right. I believe it, that the, the book is a large book to, <laughs> to have to commit to memory practically. Do you need to be recertified in this then every so often? Yes, every six years you have continuing education units, mm -hmm. and that brings you up on the most current to date practices in the field as well. Yes, yes, okay, understand. Let's then get into this book, Robert's Rules of Order. When was it written and why? Originally 1876. Okay. It was written by a Dr. Henry M. Mar General Henry M. Martin. Okay. Would you like a little history? Yeah, I would. All right. I'd like to hear about him. His, his grandfather was a minister. His father was an educator. Robert was a general in the army. Okay. So he had a church background with meetings and then being in the army, he was transferred many times across the United States. Then he would also lead collegiate lectures. Oh. As he traveled across the United States, he noticed that all of the different organizations had their own rules of order. Oh. He was the first one to codify these rules for organizations outside of government, non-government oh, organizations. When he codified it, that allowed people from one part of the country to travel to another part of the country and to be able to know the same rules in a meeting would make it very cohesive. Yes. Yes, yes, that would make sense. So what is actually the basic purpose of Robert's Rules of Order? What does it do for a meeting? It provides fairness for the participants in the meeting, and that's what you really want. You, you, a bad meeting is when both sides are yelling at each other. <laughs> I mean, that's a bad meeting. Robert's <laughs> is rules to make fairness and then when they're applied, they make the meetings efficient. Both sides can be heard. Decisions can be made with input from both sides. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometimes I think when we sit in a meeting and we use Robert's Rules of Order, it, it bogs down a meeting. But you say, in fact, it's just the opposite. Yes, yes, we were talking about that earlier. Most people think that Roberts are rules that hinder an organization. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can only talk for two minutes. You can only do this. 
Now, an organization usually has bylaws. That is what yes. the members agree to for the purpose of their organization. Mm -hmm. A parliamentarian makes sure that debate is handled according to their bylaws, that they're, okay. they're doing business according to their own bylaws, and then Roberts comes in and tells you how to procedurally do that correctly. Mm -hmm. You agree ahead of time. Shall we all be allowed to speak for two minutes, for okay. 10 minutes? Should we, and so forth. Uh -huh. Therefore, the meeting actually becomes quite fair. And I like that part of it. It puts everyone on an even footing. Yes. So then everyone can ex freely express their opinions. Yes. And, and feel like they can do that. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. So <coughs> we had an interesting discussion right before we started to tape between Nebraska NICE and parliamentary procedure. How do those go together in Nebraska? All right, first let me give you the background. Of okay. <laughs> Roberts says that his method will be able to take two impassioned different sides and bring them together to have a decision through, through Roberts having the debate. Okay. Now, when you have people that are nice like Nebraskans, we, we tend to be nice. We do. All right, when you have people that are just nice at a meeting, they tend to listen to what's going on at the meeting, but if they disagree, they're, they kind of do it like mm -hmm. kind of away from the meeting or in the background of the meeting. Okay. So that even though they're nice and they're agreeing during the meeting, <laughs> then <laughs> it becomes mm -hmm. so that it's, it's ironic because Roberts is supposed to provide the fairness for a meeting to get it done efficiently. When you have what is called a pseudo consensus this okay. people are just being nice, Right. that's when you have the conflict outside of the meeting mm -hmm. or beyond the meeting mm -hmm. where the pseudo consensus. Mm -hmm. So Nebraskans, mm -hmm. I, I tend to notice that Nebraskans tend to want to be this Nebraskan nice <laughs> in the meeting, but it leads to this pseudo consensus where okay. if we would use Roberts Stick and apply rules. it, mm -hmm. then we would have the sure. fairness. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. You told me that using this procedure can even help in our everyday lives. Yes. How, how can that help us? <laughs> All right, Roberts is for groups of two or more. Okay. What basic relationship in life could have two or more? <laughs> you can have a husband and wife. You can have a mom and a child. You can have a, a parent and, and a, yes. their child. So I joke that Roberts can be applied, for example, um, the uh, the husband says, I'm going to go out to the motorcycle show this weekend and I'll just leave the wash for later oh. and the wife can go, point of order, it's your weekend to do the wash. <laughs> so it'll take the emotion out of that situation, yes, right? Isn't yes. that what it's based on? Yes, <laughs> okay. so it's quite interesting. I wish I would have known this 35 years ago <laughs> with my children, that would have helped. So Karen, what do you feel is the least understood rule of order? Just in, in, like in running a meeting, what is the least understood rule of order? Most people believe that all motions have to be seconded. Oh, well, yes, I think most people do think that, and that's not right. It's theoretically right, but in practice, when an organization elects a presiding officer or a president, okay. they are the ones that are supposed to uh, preside over the meeting. And where do you have the presiding officer sit? You have them sit in front of people, in front of the whole group. Right. You have them stand at a lectern so everyone can see them. Okay. But the opposite is true. The presiding officer can then see everyone in the assembly. So if someone would make a motion, let's support the Nebraska football team, and if the president sees people nodding their head yes, the president, can, the presiding officer can go ahead and process that motion without a second because he can tell that most people in the assembly would would agree with that motion. Now, Interesting. he can start processing the motion. Someone who would disagree with that then uh -huh. during debate could counter debate and have sure. debate opposed. But to have the motion offered and the president start to process the motion and then have the, someone say, point of order, there was no second, <laughs> that's really not necessary. <laughs> Motions. See. Theoretically need a second, but the presiding officer is the one who can process the motion okay. without right. a second. And really, when someone makes a second, 
to a motion. They just mean, let's debate this, right? They, yes. don't, they don't necessarily even have to be in favor of it. They that just want to hear the debate, correct? That is correct. Okay. All right. I know being a professional, you help struggling organizations, and but besides in running meetings, there are other ways that you can help organizations, such as in, even in minute taking or bylaw writing. What are some of the most common mistakes an organization makes when taking their minutes? They want to put everything in the minutes, okay. everything. So-and-so said this, so-and-so said that. We took a five minute recess break in the minutes, the minutes show what an organization has agreed upon to do, the actions of the organization. Mm -hmm. Typically, I can take six pages worth of minutes mm -hmm. and I go through and I find what did this organization decide to do through an adopted motion. And I can condense uh, minutes down to a page. Yeah, so make them succinct. Just, succinct. Just, it's, yeah. And then typically you can look at an organization's minutes and really find out how much they do I see. By, by looking at their minutes to see sure. how many motions do they adopt, what kind of motions have they adopted, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, or is their mm -hmm. minutes just fluff and they just reinvent the wheel or just... Mm -hmm. And how important are bylaws to an organization? Bylaws are your objectives. And yet no one ever wants to serve on a bylaw committee, but they're so important, right? Absolutely. Bylaws are what your organizations, the, are the objectives of your organization. So when you first get together, you make your bylaws, that's what you are coming together. You all agree, this is what we believe is important, mm -hmm. and this is what our organization, the potential we could have if all of us agree to these bylaws. We're more mighty as an organization okay. than one individual. It's really the skeleton of the organization. Yes. Mm -hmm. And may and I add something? There. You may. That's why re revisions of bylaws need to be done about every three years, because look how fast our society changes. Okay. They, so you need to have your bylaws reviewed, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. is where a parliamentarian can help you. You said most people don't like to do revisions. Mm -hmm. If an organization would come to me and say, we want our bylaws reviewed, I have them tell me, okay, what are your, or I'd have them tell me just in a conversation, I what's see. your organization's objectives, okay. how are you headed, what have you been doing lately, and I get it from them, what is the current feel of their organization. Then I'll go back and read their bylaws, then I can make suggestions for revising them to bring them up to date so they will currently re they will reflect their current objectives. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that, that all makes a lot of sense, Karen. Well, I know Robert's Rules of Order itself, I mean, it's been enforced since 1876, so it's gone through a number of revisions. How does it keep up with technology and all the changes in society? And uh, just, just a couple quick points on that. All right. <clears throat> Robert set up, Robert wrote the original book, and then his second wife helped him to revise it. Okay. And after Robert passed, his daughter-in-law took it up, Sarah Corbin Roberts, and then a foundation was established, it was passed down, Henry Robert III was the head of the foundation, and now he has passed. About every 10 years, the book is revised. I see. So they since have about to keep 1980. Up. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. And then it can have the most current. Yes. Like we said, uh, meetings sure. are now sure. done by the internet, so the most current revision. Well, Karen, we're going to be putting up some websites on screen Wonderful. in case someone is interested in this subject. And talk just a brief second about your local meetings, your chapter here. All right, we have we have a Lincoln area chapter. Okay. We have people come in all the way from. Um, Eagle and people mm -hmm. all the way from Norfolk. We have a Lincoln area. Mm -hmm. It's called the Star City Area Unit of Parliamentarians. Okay. All right. We meet on the fourth Monday night every month. And the public is welcome, the right? The public is I welcome. I think that's so, that's wonderful to get out there. It's I think free. It would be a and it's free. I think it would be a fascinating meeting. I'm sorry that our segment is coming to an end, but I certainly thank you for being here today and helping us all be more efficient, effective communicators. My pleasure. Karen Watson, thank you so much. And as I bring the gavel down on this segment, please remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Hi, I'm Randy Jones with Aging Partners. Did you know that Lincoln expects a 75% increase in the number of seniors living in our community over the next 15 years? Aging Partners is a community service that provides fitness programs to help keep older adults strong and healthy. This year, Lincoln Cares donations are providing funds for new fitness equipment. 
You can help make this happen. Sign up to support Lincoln Cares and add $1 to your LES bill each month. Welcome to Live and Learn. The Brain Injury Alliance of Nebraska provides support and advocacy for people who have brain injuries. I'm Doug Jones, and joining me today are Peggy Reicher and Dale Johannes. And uh, Peggy, let's uh, talk, uh, start a little bit about the background of, of the agency you're involved with. Sure. Um, the Brain Injury Alliance in Nebraska is a 501c3, so we're a nonprofit advocating for people with brain injury, kind of the voice of brain injury in Nebraska. Um, we started back in about 2009, 2010 to kind of help expand services, um, increase awareness, provide advocacy, prevention, and education for people with brain injury. You talk about two definitions of brain injury, the traumatic brain injury and, and the acquired brain injury. Mm -hmm. Tell us, give us a little background there and the definitions. Sure. Acquired brain injury is kind of the overall umbrella of brain injury. All brain injury falls under acquired. Um, traumatic falls under acquired. Acquired can be a stroke, um, somebody who's had cancer, um, who's had meningitis. It can be a tumor removal. Um, it can be an anoxic injury. That's a type of acquired brain injury. Traumatic is an injury that has uh, what we hear about a lot more where there's a bump, a blow, a jolt to the head. We think of that happening when car accidents, assaults, falls, things like that. These days we hear a lot about brain injuries related to concussions with athletic events, mm -hmm. but, but there are lots of other, as you indicated, lots of other causes of, of brain injury. And what are the main causes of, of injuries that people that you work with? Well, the primary um, injury right now, um, brain injury cause is falls. People, especially as we all age, we get older, we are more ten have a greater tendency to fall. Um, the other is being struck or hit by, um, and, and it's where you have like an assault. Um, mm -hmm. Motor vehicles is also uh, a high reason for getting a brain injury. Um, so those are, a, a, a sports injury, a concussion, oftentimes is referred to as just a concussion, but a concussion is a brain injury also. Yeah, right, I think that gets sort of fuzz it over sometimes and it, yeah, there really is a brain issue there. It is there. a brain injury. <laughs> the signs though, um, sometimes they're immediate and sometimes not so immediate. Um, mm -hmm. what, are, what are the signs of brain injuries? Well, typically what we hear people talk about, we kind of put it into three different domains. We see physical, cognitive, and emotional. Um, some physical signs after a person has had a hit on the head or fallen or whatnot is that we'll see moments of, uh, they have complaints of headaches, dizziness, um, nauseousness, maybe some vision problems, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to um, sound, and so those are some main physical components. When we think of the um, cognitive components, it falls under people are having problems with memory, attention, concentration. Problems with what we call executive functioning, being able to process information in a way that you would expect somebody to be able to do. Um, the third is kind of emotional. We um, sometimes see irritability, anxiety, mood swings, impulsivity, just acting different. And people want to attribute that to just moodiness, but if they've hit their head, it can be also because of a brain injury. But these are might be immediate, but they might be delayed? They might be immediate, but they might be delayed. I know in working with some of the students, for example, or even working in the aging population, saying you might not see these signs or symptoms show up for up to 48 hours after a fall or after a hit. So um, being able to correlate the two, going back to a little bit of the history, like what had happened, and does this reside within that 48 hours? Dale, you're a volunteer helping people in, in these situations. Um, tell us a little bit about your experience with a brain injury. Uh, mine happened 30 years ago, more than just over 30 years ago. Um, I was 17. I was in a, a car accident. I was a passenger in a car that ran a stop sign through a 55 mile an hour street. Um, the car that struck us hit us directly on the passenger door, my door, going 46 miles an hour. Um, they calculated that in the accident report. 
Um, I broke 17 ribs, I punctured both my lungs, I shattered my jaw, I cracked my pelvis, and some other stuff. But the worst thing that happened to me was the fact that I had a brain injury. Because of the brain injury, I was unable to speak for six weeks, and when I could speak again, I had the maturity level of a second grader. Um, I've just been incredibly fortunate to um, be able to come all the way back. Oftentimes, this doesn't happen. And um, because of that, I've, I, I, need, I, need to, I needed at that time, well, and still do, I need to work with people with brain injury to repay, uh, I feel it's an obligation to repay things, to, to repay what I I've, what I've went through. Um, I worked at a place in Oman called Quality Living for about nine years after, after I graduated from college. Um, and then when I moved down here to Lincoln, I became part of the Brain Injury Advisory Council. And on that council in 2008, eight, um, I became the lead of a subsection of the group looking at elderly, the elderly population and brain injury. Um, one thing that, uh, over time, one thing that I've realized is that um, I was very fortunate in that while my injuries were substantial, um, they were able to identify, identify the fact that I had a brain injury right away. So, so what were the keys then to your, this recovery process? Honestly, 30 years later, still looking. <laughs> um, but persistence was one of them. And again, as I mentioned, um, the, the ability to, the, the fact that I knew what I was dealing with right away, I mean, because there was, there was obvious issues that I had, uh, I was dealing with some stuff. And um, so they, I was able to begin therapy right away. Whereas individuals in the elderly population oftentimes aren't as fortunate. Individuals in the elderly population also often have uh, what are called comorbidities or other diagnoses actually that you can see. And the vast majority of the time, those other diagnoses, diagnoses that you can see are gonna be what gets the attention. And the brain injury is, is an afterthought. But in reality, um, brain injury in this population is a huge, huge issue. It presents very similar to dementia, whereas dementia, um, <clears throat> a dementia diagnosis will come after months and years, after an extended period of seeing a doctor, and, and it's a slow decline. Um, with a brain injury, it's going to be almost immediate. As Peggy said, it could take up to 48 hours, but in, re in looking and comparing that to dementia, 48 hours is nothing. You, Dale, you've, you've come a long way, as you describe here. Um, so a person with a brain injury then can, can lead what we might call a normal life? I mean, it's, maybe that's not a correct term here, but... It's... Occasionally, individuals are able to lead a normal life. Oftentimes, it's going to be a new normal. Um, and it, ju it just takes time. And um, oftentimes that, that time is something that individuals in the elderly population aren't fortunate enough to have. So prevention is gonna be a huge issue in this population. Another issue with, with uh, aging is that our brains shrink as, as we age. Yeah, and... Um, what, how, how does that sort of uh, factor in here? And actually, it took me a long time to realize. I, I couldn't understand how what I went through could be the same thing of, of just a fall. I mean, a car accident and a fall could cause the same, same issues. I couldn't understand that. But beginning in, in young adulthood, the, a cognitively healthy brain can shrink 1.9% every 10 years, as, as is shown in the uh, display in the picture there. That just, over time, that, that, that adds up and there's more space in, the, in, the, in your skull for your brain to move. Um, the rate of brain shrinkage increases with age and it becomes more prominent around the age of 60. And as the brain size decreases, the skull size stays the same, which increases the likelihood of, of your brain bouncing around the inside of your skull. Because of this, falls with the head strike become more life-threatening as we age. So then, uh, what are then seniors, what, what should they be particularly aware of or sensitive to in terms of trying to uh, not, be, not experience brain injuries? One very important thing, oh, there, there, are, three, there are three things here that I, that I, would, lit, that I would suggest that are, that are on display there. Um, 
they should screen for screen the, their living area for tripping hazards such as rugs, cords, or oxygen tubing, if that's something that there will be mm -hmm. in their environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pets are another tripping hazard. Toys, are, uh, if kids are in the environment, and how furniture is placed. Um, the assessment part, you need, you need to assess, assess for risk, risk factors. Does the person need a walker? Their mental status, the gait pattern, and there may be tendencies. By tendencies, I mean by getting up quickly um, from chairs, they're moving quickly in their environment. And finally, on the list, um, intervention. That's going to be, um, does, is an assistive device needed, like, like a walker or a cane or something? Uh, having proper footwear, is the lighting of the area good? Um, are the, uh, have the person's eyes been checked recently? And finally, for the for uh, the cognitively aware individuals, um, they need to be able to do a self-assessment before they get up in the morning to check and see how they're feeling. Very good, Peggy. Just sort of summarize this uh, for us: what people can do to help uh, prevent these accidents and and for recovery. What what do you see as the keys? As people that you've worked with. I think certainly Dale hit along a, a many of them, really looking at fall prevention. What can we do to just look at our environment, get our eyes checked, have the doctors that you're working with have a good understanding of, of what your environment looks like and also taking a look at medications. Sometimes medications can cause some dizziness and whatnot, so um, just being aware. If people um, want more information or they have some questions about what we've discussed. Um, you're open to discuss uh, this with people. How do they get in touch with you? Yeah, certainly. Um, we encourage folks to give us a call. We're also online on the Brain Injury Alliance of Nebraska, www.biane.org. Um, and also on that website also is our phone number that they can reach us at. We've sort of focused on uh, aging here but but uh, you work with all ages we do we are a statewide organization working with all ages and uh, do you have outreach throughout the state or or how, how do you make contact with people across the state right now they're um if, if somebody's been identified or diagnosed with a brain injury they get our information through a brain injury registry letter um, but certainly um, it, brain injury can happen to anyone anytime anywhere and so um, the ways in which we promote ourselves is opportunities like this, but also encouraging people to look at our website. Thanks for sharing this. This is a lot of good information, and we hope people will take advantage of, if they're in that situation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Remember, it's never too late to live and learn how to prevent brain injuries. Hi, I'm Randy Jones with Aging Partners. Did you know that Lincoln expects a 75% increase in the number of seniors living in our community over the next 15 years? Aging Partners is a community service that provides fitness programs to help keep older adults strong and healthy. This year, Lincoln Cares donations are providing funds for new fitness equipment. You can help make this happen. Sign up to support Lincoln Cares and add $1 to your LES bill each month. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Lita Powell Drake. And how long has it been since you have been to the Lincoln Children's Zoo? Wait until you see the changes. John Chapo is the CEO and president of the Lincoln Children's Zoo. We welcome you. I know you've had been there for a long time. Now, we want to go back and add a little bit of the history of Absolutely. the zoo. Absolutely. Now, um, it, Arnold Folsom was the first one to begin. Would you explain it and when it began? Yep. 1959, Arnett Folsom had a dream. So 60 years ago, Arnett said, I want to bring a children's zoo to Lincoln. The children in Lincoln need a great experience to encounter animals. And so Arnett Folsom became just, he just became consumed by the fact that the children in Lincoln needed the opportunity to meet animals close up and nose to nose. Well, what about, what was the mission, his original mission? His mission is the same mission we have today. Oh. To, to, to enrich lives through first-hand interaction with living things. He always wanted kids to meet animals, pet animals, in a beautiful landscape setting. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted kids riding ponies, feeding the goats, and all kinds of great stuff. Okay, now Arnett Folsom in 1959. 1959. Oh. 
60 years ago. He was, a, he was a Boy Scout leader, he was a business leader. You know, he was, just, like I said, he was consumed. And as my understanding, if you saw Arnett Folsom walking down the street, you ran to the other side, because he didn't care how rich or how poor you were, <laughs> he was gonna ask you for a donation to create that children's zoo in Lincoln. Exactly. Okay, now what's new at the zoo? Oh, all kinds of things oh, that are new at the zoo. What's, what's really important though is that we have stayed true to Arnett's mission of engaging kids. And so with, for years, then it, they, they've been able to ride ponies and feed the ghosts and have butterflies light on their fingers. Well, what's new at the zoo now is all kinds of great, bigger animals at the zoo because we've gotten just a little bit bigger. Now you can come to the zoo and feed giraffes. Can imagine feeding the <laughs> tallest animal in the world. And that's Joey. And Joey's going to be getting up to 18 feet tall. Oh. And kids, year round, no matter what time of year, they can either feed the giraffes inside or outside in the feeding deck. Well, so that's the exciting thing. It's going to be awesome. And, the, and it's open year round. Yeah, thank My you. Goodness. Exactly. Which, which we've always been a seasonal zoo. When yeah. the zoo first opened, it was Memorial Day to Labor Day. And then it was totally empty. Now we're going to go year round for the kids. Okay. Now... The entrance, even the entrance has expanded. It has expanded, Leader. You're absolutely right. We've gone back to A Street, okay? So we got a big fancy new entrance that clearly marks where it is. And so you can come in, you can see even see it at night all lit up. So that's just it. We're back to the A Street entrance. We were there A Street when the zoo opened up, then we went to 27th Street. Now we're back to A. You're back to A Street. Yes, and so that's a huge area. What, what, what's the whole total? Well, the whole total of the zoo now is about 14 acres. Whoa. Okay. Yeah, it started at four acres, but it's, but it's still great. It's still engagement. We're still one of the smallest zoos in the country. Okay. Oh. Yeah, it, per acre size, but we run more people through acre of the zoo than any other zoo in the country because we're a great, rich experience. And it's open year round. Year round. I mean, that yeah. is so marvelous. Yeah. You can see the tigers year round. You can feed the giraffes year round. You can see the red pandas year round, and so <laughs> many other things on a year round basis. And you've uh, expanded the entrance. We have. The entrance is really great. It's going to make it a lot easier. And we have handicap parking right near the entrance, too, Lita. It's going to make it the perfect area, so it's very, very convenient. You, you, you park, and within 20 feet, you're within the zoo. And as soon as you walk in the zoo, the red pandas are walking overhead. <laughs> it's only red panda exhibit with a log overhead in the United States. <laughs> so it's really an awesome experience. All right, we want to look at some of the animals. Absolutely. Uh, the, you know, the new ones and some, the, what, what about some of the old ones? You know, the, the iconic animals at the zoo have always been, you know, feeding the goats. Mm -hmm. And kids love to feed their goats. I don't care how old you are or how young you are, you know, feeding the goats is something that is just, you know, that's just Look a, at that darling it, little child. And we still have those classic <laughs> opportunities. You know, that was, you know, over 50 years ago, that child, and, that, and that's the wonder. Look the wonder in that face uh -huh. and that's what kids still get when they come to the Lincoln Children's Zoo is that wonder. <laughs> it's a lot and, of and the giraffe has been around, the big big giraffe big has guys. been around for a long time. Well the big, well I mean the giraffe just arrived this year. Okay, so the drafts just arrived this year, uh, so they're, they're brand new to the Lincoln Children's Zoo, oh. so we're really excited about them. That's when the youngsters, and they're growing up and getting taller, and sooner, before you know it, they're going to be 15, 16, 17, 18 feet tall. Exactly. Well, how do you feed? How do you feed the giraffe? Uh, <laughs> you don't <laughs> need a carefully. ladder. You don't need a ladder. You know, the zoo's designed specifically so the kids' feet are eight feet above the giraffe's feet, okay? So you're up on an elevated deck, and then you just get your leaf of lettuce, and those tongues, you know, 18 inches long oh. come out, and those big necks come down, and so it's just a phenomenal. You know, I've been doing zoo work now for 46 years, and I still love feeding giraffes. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> and how do you feed the monkeys? Uh, <laughs> well, you no, you don't get to feed the monkeys, but you get to climb the, with the monkeys. We're going to have the kids climbing. Remember the but old you have to feed the monkeys. Well, the zookeepers have to feed the monkeys. Uh -huh. Exactly. The zookeeper special diet. But the old historic zoo building that was built by the WPA in 1936, mm -hmm. the Children's Zoo is renovating that space, okay? And so a lot of people may remember the old spitting monkey. That well, was <laughs> I was just going to, because that, that monkey spit at me many years I, ago. Well, and he, he was not making an editorial about you. He spit <laughs> at everybody, okay, Lita? But now we brought monkeys back to that building, and we got the climbing, and kids will be able to climb with rare black faced spider monkeys 20 feet up in the air. Kids will be climbing with the monkeys. There will be glass between the kids oh, and the so monkeys. Oh, so if the monkey spits at you, then you're not going to get You're not going to get wet. Oh. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's going to be safe for the kids, fun for the kids. It's going to be a great year-round experience. I mean, literally, kids climbing way up in the air. It, it's going to be the most unique zoo experience, I think, in the country. <laughs> and then... 
the tiger. Yes, the Sumatran tiger. Oh boy! Oh, tell we, us we, about. We have, we you, have, did you have to go to Sumatra to get? No, them? we didn't. They were actually like all the zoo animals are born at other zoos. Okay, these oh. our tigers actually came from the San Diego Safari Park. Okay, and we have Sum, uh, we have Kumar and Axel. They're three and a half and three years old. They're beautiful brothers, and they're you know the the, the Sumatran tiger is the rarest tiger species in the world. Maybe four or five hundred exist in the wild. They're, they're critically endangered. So the children's zoos teamed up with about a, a dozen other zoos to help save the Sumatran tiger from extinction. Well, well how much space do you need for an animal that you know, it's got to roam? And that's uh, a very good know. question, Lee. We have built a huge brand new facility. It's got a big outdoor yard. It's got 5,000 5, square feet outside. It's got a waterfall. It's got a stream because tigers love water. It's got a special cave that's heated in the wintertime and cooled in the summertime. And what's really great is that the kids get into a share a Jeep with the tigers. The tigers are on one half of the Jeep, the kids are in the other half. But there's a two inch pane of glass between the kids and, uh -huh. and the tigers. So it's, it's safe for the kids when they get in with the tigers. So, and then they have three great big bedrooms and other outdoor spaces. So we have built one of the premier tiger facilities in the country for our very, very Sumatran tigers uh, at the Lincoln Children's Zoo. Oh, I'm Zoo. impressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, w what do you consider the most unique animal <laughs> at the Lincoln Children's Zoo? Well, there's a lot of very unique animals that I'm very lucky to see on, on a regular basis. But Probably one of the strangest and most unique is the tamandua. Uh, is that a, say that again? <laughs> tamandua. Tamandua. The tamandua. On the road to Mandua. On the road to Tamandua. There you go. You you can make a song out of the word Tamandua, Lita. Uh, they they're also known as lesser anteaters or an arboreal tree dwelling anteater. That long nose has like a uh, almost a two-foot tongue that comes out of very long and skinny that's great at eating termites and ants okay and they got big claws for climbing trees and ripping trees apart to get to the insects and, and they have prehensile tails so they're great for climbing in the rainforest and they're just a fascinating fascinating this is Eden Eden is a is a brand new tamandua at the Lincoln Children's Zoo and so we're really ex excited to have her there I like to get one of those at home and get rid of some <laughs> of the, my, the ants <laughs> well this is the time of year the ants are kind of moving in because yeah. Yeah, starting to move around, you know. So, yeah, yeah. our little tamandua could be pretty <laughs> helpful. Uh, but the tamandua needs about 9,000 ants a day. Have you got that many? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're just fascinating creatures with those long noses and those long, sticky tongues. Okay, now, do you need senior volunteers? That's what we're all about. We always need volunteers. The Lincoln Children's Zoo, you know, serves our communities only because of the great people. And we have hundreds of volunteers, hundreds of youth, and a lot of adult volunteers. So if you want to volunteer at the zoo, call Jordan Slagle at the zoo at 402-475-6741. And her direct extension is 129. Or you can email her at jschlagle at lincolnzoo.org. So we got great opportunities for adults. For age people, what, 50 something and older? And absolutely, you know, we got some great, we got some great folks who are engineering the train. Imagine oh, oh, yeah. blowing the whistle oh, oh, and oh, having yeah. hun hundreds of happy kids. Or maybe you're a gardener and you can help in our garden because we got, we got two great horticulturists on staff and they're professionals and they could always use great volunteers. Okay. What do the volunteers do? Well, you know, they, they help weed the gardens, they help prune the plants, they, do, they help plant the plants, they help blow those train whistles. They may even help in the office, okay? Or maybe even help chop up food at the zoo to help serve the animals. Now, the, the guys, are there guys who run the train? Uh, ladies can also. Oh, ladies. We, oh, have, you we have lady engineers, exactly. Oh, excellent. Oh, we're, we're totally liberated at the Lincoln <laughs> Children's Zoo. Exactly. So, yeah, we, we and you know, sometimes it's even fun for couples, you know, one to engineer, because we always need two people on the train, one up front engineering, the other one keep doing the safety and, and back. So it's great for couples, too, who want to volunteer at the zoo. <laughs> exactly. So we got lots of opportunities. Okay. If, if somebody wants to volunteer, you're interested in that, uh, who, who do they call? Call Jordan at the Lincoln Children's Zoo. Jordan okay. Schlegel is a wonderful a young lady who just, she's enthusiastic about the zoo. She helps make things happen at the zoo because we got a great team of folks who call Jordan Schlegel at the Lincoln Children's Zoo at 402-475-6741. And her her direct extension is 129. Get a hold of Jordan. She'll love to talk to you. You didn't even have to look at the teleprompter <laughs> in order to read that. You just, <laughs> that came out of your mouth. You've been there so long. Now, how long has it been? 33 years, Lita. 33 years and counting. Yeah, you know, I moved to Lincoln, Nebraska 33 years ago just for a couple, three years, because who wants to live in Lincoln, Nebraska? <laughs> Lincoln's an awesome community. I love the Children's Zoo. I love Lincoln. Tracy and I fell in love. We got three great sons uh, that have grown up here. So Lincoln's our community. 
Well, we're certainly glad that you're here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what, what's the most unusual thing that has happened to you during those 33 years oh, at the zoo? The most unusual, you know, is probably when I've been on live TV and I had an animal bite me and I start to bleed and I kind of got a, <laughs> you know, so that's <laughs> happened. Or, or, you know, what animals do besides bite, they also have stuff come out the other end. Oh, yeah. I, I was standing talking to 500 kids once in a school auditorium with a great big lizard and the lizard just kind of all over me not once twice in front of five. and the kids just kind of went oh but i kept on talking i kept on educating them because <laughs> you know with animals you can never plan how do you clean up lizard uh, with it <laughs> very carefully and with a lot of mops and a, and a lot of disinfectant yeah uh, for you since you've been around for a long yeah. time what is your most uh, favorite animal Oh boy, Lena, that's such a hard question. You know, I, I'm because I'm amazed every day. You know, I'm a tortoise guy. My nickname when I was a kid was Turtle John because I I always had turtles and tortoises, and I love the Galapagos tortoises at the zoo that came in the size of a tennis ball, but now the Galapagos tortoises are they're 50 pounds on their way oh to becoming 400 pounds in the next hundred years. <laughs> and the marvelous thing is the great great grandchildren of Arnett Folsom. That's right now come to the zoo. Exactly, that, and that's what warms my heart. You know, Arnett's granddaughter was a teenager when, the zoo, when Grandpa was working on the zoo, and she now brings her granddaughters, and she says, John, you're doing exactly what Grandpa wanted. Oh, you're good. keeping Grandpa's vision and mission yeah. alive, and that's what's important to me, connecting those kids, and five generations of, of Folsom's, that's the way it should be. <laughs> and remember, the zoo is open all year round now. Isn't that marvelous? Exactly. Oh, what a gift to Lincoln. Our it is. thanks to you, John Chapel, for being there for 33 years and, My and pleasure. carrying the torch for the you, Lincoln you Children's Zoo. Lita, you know what? I'll right. see you at the zoo. You, <laughs> you better remember, it's never too late to live and learn more about the Lincoln Children's Zoo.